So my name is Fred Shu from a company called rtb.com slash manage.com. Manage is the parent company. rtb.com does basically RTB channel aggregation for, for, uh, for UA purposes mostly. I have today with me a great panel of industry experts. We have Paul Longhenry from TapJoy, Paul Cushman from Drawbridge, David Diaz from SponsorPay, and Hanno Fichter from AppLift. I'm going to go around and maybe do some introductions, have the guys do some introductions, maybe spend two or three minutes, uh, talk about three things. First, your name, your company, and maybe like a quick case study so everybody here can get uh, uh, kind of a quick connection with what you do. So why don't we start with David at the end. Great. So my name is David Diaz, uh, developer relations at SponsorPay. Uh, essentially, SponsorPay is a monetization and user acquisition platform on mobile and on the web. Uh, some of our, our main things that we've been working on is uh, diversifying our, our platform to not only limit games. Uh, some of our biggest verticals now include travel, e-commerce, security, browsers, dating, um, entertainment apps as well. Um, and essentially what we've been working on recently is to be able to drive high quality users at scale um, via our offer wall and video platforms as well as being able to, uh, being able to as I said, drive at scale. So that's our, those are our main platforms. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Good, good, good. Hey, um, so my name's Paul Cushman. I run sales and BD at Drawbridge. Uh, I've been in the mobile advertising business in the US for 10 years. So yeah, the first six really sucked, but the last four have been pretty bloody awesome. Thank you, Mr. Jobs. Um, so Drawbridge, um, quite simply, and I think you're gonna hear uh, a lot of us say a lot of the same things. Uh, Drawbridge works with brand performance clients in helping them acquire users through the mobile channel. We use uh, some simple approaches in terms of targeting, retargeting, uh, and a great deal of data analytics and modeling. Uh, and we've built a reputation in Fortune and Wall Street Journal and Forbes and other publications of being able to drive a, a higher lifetime value user for the clients that we work with. Those are clients that are concentrated in the uh, retail, commerce, travel, media subscription, and finance businesses. So pretty much uh, we work with brands that care about getting butts in seats. Uh, quick case study for you uh, from the financial services category. Um, we ran a uh, mobile acquisition program that was retargeting from the desktop into mobile not just to get the application to install, but to open. And then once it's opened, you enter in your bank account number and your social security number. Yeah, right, fat chance that's gonna happen. Pretty sparse conversion event. Um, in terms of the campaign, it was competitive. Thankfully, with no one in this room, as far as I know. Uh, and uh, we drove about 1.5x the lifetime value of the competition and about 3x the return on investment. That is a case study on our site. I'd be happy to provide the link. Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, hey everyone, this is Paul Lonkenry uh, from uh, TapJoy. Uh, I've run business and corporate development for TapJoy for about the last two and a half years. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know us, uh, we're a large mobile-focused uh, value exchange uh, advertising platform where advertisers only pay for performance, whatever action they're trying to drive uh, to mobile consumers. Um, and consumers typically get a reward of some kind, uh, usually currency inside of the app that they're currently engaging uh, in exchange for um, uh, taking that offer or following, completing the action that the user is trying to drive, whether that's uh, an app install, an app engagement, a market research survey, watching a video, engaging with a rich media ad, whatever it might be. A uh, quick case study that uh, we recently uh, released was with uh, Smule. Uh, they make an app called Magic Piano. Uh, and but one of the biggest pushbacks that we've had historically, I feel like from a publisher perspective, on the value exchange model is that if, you're, if users can earn currency um, rather than actually using in-app purchase, you know, may, potentially you're actually cannibalizing the revenue that you'd get from payers. And basically the data that we pr uh, produced with Smule was showing that um, of users that engaged with value exchange offers, they actually spent exact, almost exactly the same amount on in-app purchase as those who didn't. And so basically you had two cohorts, TapJoy users and non-TapJoy users, 
IAP was the same. It's just Tapture users, you had about another 30% of revenue for all the offers that they took. So it just kind of highlights that the model is really additive to an application experience uh, and actually drives greater engagement as well from a time perspective. Yeah, hi. I'm, uh, I'm Hanno from um, Hitfox and AppLift. Um, so I'm the co-founder of uh, Hitfox, which is an incubator or company builder uh, focused on game marketing and game distribution, headquartered in Berlin, uh, 100 people in the, in the group. And um, I'm uh, just opening or opened the office for um, one of the portfolio companies for AppLift in uh, San Francisco. And AppLift is a games uh, marketing network. So it's uh, on, on the one side driving users for 100 plus uh, game publishers. And on the other side, it's uh, monetizing traffic uh, for like 600 uh, media partners around the world. Uh, and we drive more than 1 million installs per game per month for uh, some of the biggest um, uh, partners we work with. And um, to give you one, uh, one case study uh, on the monetization side, um, we, for example, um, are integrated with Closer. Uh, Closer is an app in, uh, in France. It's a um, people magazine. Um, and um, they integrate our, um, uh, our gift uh, concept, which is um, presenting um, our offers as a, as a nice gift, gift box. And you, um, as a user, you click on this gift, and then you zoom in into um, the, the, the gift, and you see the wrapping paper. And then you scratch away um, the wrapping paper, and you see a free game that is given to you as a gift. Um, and uh, the conversion rate and the click-through rate uh, is super high, and it uh, generated an eCPM of more than 30 US dollar for, for this um, partner. Yeah. So that's a case study for the monetization side. Thanks. Thanks, guys. And actually, David, did you have a quick case study from uh, the sponsor side that you can sponsor pay side that you could share? Yeah. So we have a we have a case study with one of our web partners where essentially on the monetization side we were actually able to increase the number of non-paying users to paying users by over 16 percent by using our value exchange video model. Um, so that's been something that's been been great for us is that not only does our product help to monetize your users, um, but it also helps to increase the number of paying users as well. Thank you. So the topic of this panel is basically mobile ad network evolution. We kind of want to take a look at where the market from user acquisition was for mobile ad networks was a year ago and kind of compare and contrast to where it is today. Uh, what works, what worked then, what works now, continued challenges in the marketplace. We want to kind of have an open discussion uh, for each mobile ad network uh, and also focus on unique approaches to drive value for their advertisers. So first, uh, one question is, we see sort of a shift in ad formats. We spoke about this uh, some in the last panel, but uh, we'd love to get a good feel from you guys uh, individually where ad formats are going for the next 12 to 18 months, and also what makes you guys unique in that respect. How about uh, Hanno, why don't you start? Yeah, if, if you look back like um, one, one year ago, it's, um, uh, the ad formats were mainly uh, banners and uh, interstitials. And um, now it's moving into the direction of non-intrusive ad formats, uh, like this uh, gift um, uh, format that I just uh, mentioned, where it's uh, integrated in the game and um, the, the gift is, for example, um, uh, presented by a character in the game. So if you think about Doodle Jump, you could think that the Jump uh, mascot is, is holding uh, this this offer for you, so it's uh, like a feeling like part of the game, and it's not intrusive and not uh, not disturbing the user. Um, and why is that beneficial? It's beneficial because uh, you will really get uh, good users and high quality because the user doesn't feel um, um, disturbed. He really sees this as a part of the game. Yeah. And Paul? Yeah. Uh, I a year ago, I really enjoyed starting like biz dev meetings by you know saying banner ads suck, they don't work, just to get a rise out of people. It just doesn't work anymore because I think everybody's already concluded the banner ads suck and they don't really work. Um, I think what we're you know we haven't supported that model. We've always supported an offer wall or full screen interstitials, and I think that's kind of what we're seeing the market do. Uh, Mopub released some data recently that kind of showed the percentage of their exchange, exchange traded inventory, which is full screen interstitials, and it seems like publishers are adopting it really quickly. I think you'll see a lot of creativity in that full screen format. Quick question for all of you lot. Um, who's on the supply side in the room? Can you raise your hand? 
Only a couple of you. And then on the demand side. Okay, a bit more. So, yeah, let me just, just quantify um, banners suck. So, um, I just went through some of our data before we came through. So, 320 by 50 uh, banners make up about 73% of the inventory we see through exchanges and direct partnerships. Now, hey, hands on hand, right, we, 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 do, we only care about performance. That banner size drove about 21% of conversions. So if you are uh, trying to make a business out of selling 300 by 50 banners, I'd really panic right now. Um, I would certainly get all of the humans out of the way of that inventory and just let the machines go buy and sell it. Because when you do, it's actually quite efficient and you can, you can actually get that inventory to work. But as any CMO will tell you, that's not a brand medium. What we are seeing is things like 320 by 480 full page interstitials where the user experience is also consistent with how they are swiping through a site. They then see a nice full page ad. That unit also gives the capability of not only a nice impactful and well presented ad, but it's also a format capable of taking video and other formats, all of which have nice CPMs. So I think certainly what we're seeing from the scalable part of the market, I'm not talking about native, from the scalable part of the market, you are going to see a very significant shift towards interstitial advertising with us seeing uh, less ads, but of a more greater size that have more impact is quite clearly where the market is going to be going, I would say, not even in the next 12 months, I'd say the next six. Not supposed to be agreeing. Uh, yeah, but you and I got the same first name, so I like you. Um, so I'll say some of the main differences that have happened in the last year. Uh, one, the, uh, the use of bots has obviously decreased significantly uh, in order to rise through the charts. Um, I'd say in, uh, competition within ad networks themselves has increased dramatically. So a year ago, you could go to a select few networks um, in order to get your buys, and now essentially uh, it take, it takes, it's much more difficult now to... Uh, it, on, the, on the buy side, you got to go to, you know, you can't just go to two or three different networks in order to get all your traffic. Um, so you got to diversify your sources. And then I'd say another big one is, is the use of targeting. Um, so now advertisements are now targeted more heavily towards certain types of users. Um, so using, you know, different models, making sure that the users that are seeing the ads are essentially the non-paying ones um, and trying to, like, alternatively monetize them. Um, something that we do, uh, that we've been uh, focusing on recently has been our CPE campaigns. So we use uh, personalized engagement points in order to get a user to a certain part of an app. Um, so that could be a registration, it could be uh, finishing a level in a game, just basically any engagement point that you find increases retention, we can get a user to that certain point in your application. Thanks guys. Well, I heard about charts. Um, I think what's gonna be burning on the minds of a lot of the publisher or game developers in the audience would be, where is burst versus sustain these days? It was a certain way a year ago. How do people think about it today? Uh, why don't we start with, uh, why don't we start with Paul over at Tapjoy? Yeah, I'd say burst is a much smaller percentage of typical budget today than it was last year and certainly two years ago. Um, it, burst campaigns were never really all that prevalent in Android to begin with, but in iOS because of their um, uh, charting algorithms, it was a pretty efficient way uh, for large budgets to drive themselves into the charts and, and uh, attract organic users. Uh, I, going forward, I think many more advertisers are focused on you know, kind of a portfolio approach uh, and identifying real ROI out of their campaign spend. And I think a lot of people in this room are helping them to solve that problem. So I, I don't see that changing. Anybody else have a view on uh, burst versus sustain? Yeah, sustain only. Um, if clients are doing this, this properly, um, I would say take the metaphor that the uh, performance display in mobile right now uh, is much more like search. Uh, clients are coming in, they are doing small buys, they are starting to figure out what works, and then they are using that data to then go and explore further and manage their bids, and I don't know of any of our clients that doesn't work always on. Um, yeah, so we, we don't see a, a, a lot of burst going on right now. Yeah, also, we, we see a huge shift uh, towards sustain campaigns. Um, many um, of our partners, they, um, they start with a low volume, um, optimize the game over several weeks, 
and when they know that the, the, the game is monetizing, then they might do a burst. But um, it's not the, the model that we had like one year ago where you started to launch the game with a burst um, because you, some of the partners weren't even able to track how many instars they would, would get. So the, the only model that they could work on was uh, doing a burst and getting paid um, or, or paying the, the, the partner on a guaranteed chart position. Yeah? But this model is completely gone. I'm going to disagree a little bit um, to Paul's point. I do think that uh, sustained campaigns are definitely where the market is going. That being said, uh, I do think that bursting is still an effective strategy for some companies. Uh, it definitely does prove its value. I will say that from a year ago, the risk is much higher than it was prior. Um, so the CPI prices are higher. It costs more to get into the top 25. That being said, if you have your attention mechanics in place, uh, you've tested your title, um, there is still significant upside to doing bursting. Um, but to your point, I would definitely say that you know most campaigns, especially on the Android side, is now for us at least driving scale and driving quality. So anything that has ROI positive campaigns is what people are mostly focusing on. So in an environment where burst and sustain essentially requires moderate to aggressive budgets, how have you guys seen what qualifying factors for new customers are you are you seeing? Um, is there are there minimums in what? In what situations would you basically turn away a customer? This would be an interesting topic, I think. Yeah, I, I would turn a customer away who has a, a CPI um, that is very low and uh, expects to get uh, high volumes. Uh, so, for example, if, if you go to the US and want to get uh, non-incentivized installs for 50 cents or one dollar, um, I will tell you, you will not get enough uh, or you will not get uh, enormous installs. Yeah? So um, it's um, a lot of ex expectation management and telling him you will not uh, get uh, 100,000 installs in a month if you only pay one dollar. Yeah? Yeah, for us, it's a little bit different. Like we wouldn't turn anybody away, really. Um, our, we operate our network as an open bidded marketplace, and then we just optimize impressions uh, based upon what the expected value is to the publisher. So if you're looking for um, uh, a deep install with a lot of engagement and and not uh, be willing to actually pay a reasonable bounty for that, then it's just not going to perform. The campaign will be live. It just won't give many impressions. But in terms of like, you know, small campaigns that can perform, you know, we have a paper engagement model, which is um, you know, really growing, the f one of the fastest growing pieces of our network, where app developers are rewarding users not just for downloading the application, but for taking some, getting to some level in, in the case of a game or completing a registration or inviting a friend to try the app, whatever the action is inside their app where they know they've got to a sticky point and they're likely to have retained a user. So we're seeing a lot of folks that are pretty much unlimited spend uh, for those types of campaigns because they basically have set the trigger point to something that is likely to convert someone to an ROI positive customer. Um, measurement. Uh, if you don't know what you're measuring and you don't know how to measure it and specifically you're not working with a credible third-party vendor, you don't know what you're doing, so we'd pass. Uh, I think we're, we're along the same, same as, uh, as Paul over here in that we will pretty much not turn any advertiser away. Um, that being said, it's all about uh, managing their expectations, letting them know what sort of volume they will get at a certain price point. Um, and then you know, I'm, I'm of the personal belief that you can, be, you can make ROI positive campaigns from any advertising partner that you work with. That being said, it all depends on what, they're, what you're willing to spend and what they're willing to take. So there's, a, there's been sort of a explosion in ad SDKs recently over the past few years, even the past few months. One question I have for this panel, uh, do you have an SDK? Why should publishers install your SDK? Um, and finally, which ones do you really need, other than, of course, has offers? Um, yeah, we, we do have an SDK, but uh, we uh, recommend always not to install it. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's just for the cases um, of, uh, of partners that don't have any tracking SDK installed, they can use our SDK as a fallback. Um, but um, we always recommend stay independent, use a uh, tracking SDK, of mobile app tracking, for example, and um, set up server-to-server -server tracking so that you're independent and you're, you're not tied to one, uh, one traffic source. Yeah? And um, I think this is also the development that you see in the market. Like six months ago, everyone was installing SDKs of the partners uh, they were working with. And now everyone 
um, is shifting to server-to-server -server tracking and really stays independent. We have both a uh, publisher SDK and an advertiser SDK. Uh, the publisher SDK shows our ad units, so anybody who wishes to monetize with us, that's, that's a prerequisite. Um, our advertiser SDK really is just about install attribution and tracking. Um, and we, obviously the value proposition of folks like um, has offers for folks that are advertising across multiple networks is pretty compelling. Um, Peter probably remembers, or Peter and his colleagues probably remember uh, you know, a year and a half, uh, two years ago when they first came to try to integrate with TapJoy. I, I personally was a little resistant. Uh, I wanted our advertiser SDK to remain, but it's a pretty hard value proposition to, to push back on. Uh, when you look at it more holistically when people are running across multiple networks. Uh, so it's really about publisher SDK for us. Um, I think it's the other side of the, the point I made about measurement. If you're working with uh, a supply partner, a, 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 an ad network, and they don't work with and are integrated into every credible third party solution that's in market, they're not a credible player. Um, so I like, I like your answer. Yeah, we've got an SDK. Don't use it. We work with everyone else. We'll do server to server. We'll do whatever we need. But you don't need an SDK. And if someone's saying you need an SDK, huh? Huh? yeah, they're no good. <laughs> Bring it. So Sponsorpay does have an SDK. Um, it's a unified publisher and advertising SDK. That being said, we also have server to server tracking options. We work with all of the main third party tracking providers out there. Um, so it's really up to the developer's decision. There are some houses out there that want to have SDKs only. Um, and then there's a lot that actually just wanted to do server to server. Um, mostly, the most, most of the time when people use our SDK, it's for the video publishing platform. Um, other than that, a lot of our partners will be using AdX or has offers and the other, and a few others, uh, and we plug into every single one of those. Great. So uh, data, we, we talked about performance, we talked about basically having, making sure you have a framework to measure quality. Otherwise, it's a little bit pointless to do things like sustained or even burst spending. Data is obviously becoming a more important topic these days. Uh, companies like Drawbridge are sort of leading the way in some ways with uh, things like retargeting. Uh, how do you best re-engage users, Paul? And then I'll open it up to the rest of, uh, rest of the panel, too. Yeah. Um, I think the CMOs are uh, there's been like an interesting shift in the market, right? So everyone started with, I built an app because Steve Jobs told me to and he's way cool, to, okay, I've got an app, I now got to get an audience, so help me acquire audience, go, 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 to I've got millions and millions of app installs, but my monthly active unit user base is a single digit percentage of all of my installs, what do I do? And so what brands are now seeing is that Consumers turn off notifications after a fair period because everyone wants to notify you and then you're like, turn it all off, right? And so this is now the, a growing problem with a lot of brands. And so uh, mobile to mobile retargeting um, is very much coming to the fore of conversations with brands about how do I re-reach people that potentially look like a lapsed user. Um, some of the best practices in that regard are to ensure that the app has some form of deep linking functionality that you can run a specific message around what is the use case or the need of that person and then take them back into that point of the app. If they've shown you historically that they are a purchaser of hotel rooms and you haven't seen them for 30 days and you normally do and you want to take them back to your travel app, take them back to the hotel page. Don't take them back to the front page and if you can, take them back to the hotel page of the city that you think that they are traveling to or from or you've seen some data around that pattern so that their, their, their path to conversion becomes very smooth. You drop me back in the front page of the travel and now I've got a key in my city and restart my search, I'm less likely to convert. Similarly, desktop to mobile um, is proving very, very popular with clients. Um, everyone is realizing that a multi-screen relationship is worth more money to a brand and I need to go and reacquire my users in mobile. And email and other forms of free or, or organic traffic just aren't cutting the numbers enough for me. But I know that anybody that's on my homepage is somebody that I want to interact with on, on mobile, and I need to go and find that, that person. Um, and the best practice there is to start with the homepage. Don't start doing a lot of deep page retargeting or shopping cart abandonment retargeting. 
Just start at the top page. Just get those customers again. Once you've got that moving swiftly, now start to look at what the next level of engagement is. So again, coming back to the travel category, we saw them just doing retargeting from homepage. After that had been run for a period of time, then it was, well, let's actually segment this and do retargeting off of the hotel page, off of the flight page, and off of the car page. And maybe as we're doing that, we might start to set different metrics around those businesses because our return on ad spend is different off of those pages, and the engagement of a customer is worth different to us off of those pages. But that's how the clients are starting to bring that sophistication to, to some of the retargeting that we're doing. So if not retargeting, any, any approaches to data that you guys see, uh, uh, David, Paul, or, uh, or Hanno, for on, your, on your network, anything unique that you guys use to either optimize, uh, look for more, less, et cetera? Yeah, so, so sorry, do you mind? Yeah, some of the things that we actually do is we try to find who your loyal users are. So what we actually do is we can track how many times a user has come back to your app in a certain time period. And then what we can do is we can actually try and get you more of those users. So we will target those types of users that are constantly coming back from those certain apps um, so that you're making sure that the users that you're acquiring are loyal ones that are coming back to your app that you have the opportunity to re-engage. Um, other than that, I mean, other than the main targeting abilities, we do geo, OS targeting, um, and then device and carrier targeting are on the way. Yeah, I mean, data really is uh, mission critical for everything that, that we do. Um, and, and we're in heavily investing in enhancing those capabilities and then exposing them to our advertising partners. I mean, really where this goes in the long term is enabling campaigns to be run against um, customized user segments uh, based across, like cross-device behavior. Uh, to, as to Paul's point, being able to link to those third-party data sets, allow them to retarget their users, um, and, and to kind of combine those segments such that you are hitting exactly the right person with the right message, potentially the right incentive if you're on a network like ours, to drive the, the engagement you're looking for. But you know, anybody who's not focused on data is um, going down the wrong path. Yeah, data is also super important for us. Um, so what we are doing, uh, we are trying to optimize uh, the customer lifetime value of the users that we drive. Um, and what we do um, to, to reach this target is uh, that we define in-game events together with the advertiser. Yeah, so for example, uh, um, day one retention, day seven retention, um, or virality, uh, so um, did the user connect on Facebook and, and so on. Um, and then we get those events um, posted back um, from the advertiser um, and um, we um, match that with our traffic sources. I mentioned uh, that we have like 600 uh, traffic partners and um, we uh, kill all the traffic partners that are delivering uh, traffic that is not converting well on those events. And we are scaling the partners um, that are delivering good, uh, good traffic quality. Yeah? So in, 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 in the long run, over the course of the campaign, we can thereby increase the customer lifetime value um, of the users that we drive. Well, one, uh, one thing that we see on RTB.com is, is basically this concept of, well, we are a middleman. Um, there is an interesting shift in the marketplace, I think, at least from where I sit, coming from the web side of things. Uh, Middlemen basically are a necessary component of the ecosystem on the web. They're increasingly becoming more important on the ad network side, the mobile ad network side. Most of the people in this panel basically are middlemen or have some middleman component of them. And I know that we talked about this on the previous panel. Um, there's obviously pros, there's cons. Um, there's a view within the developer community that I'm seeing more and more of, we just hate middlemen, we hate middlemen. Okay, why do you hate middlemen? So my question to the panelists is, where do you sit in this sort of ecosystem? How many middlemen should there be? If you are an app developer, who should you trust? And what do you look for? How many middlemen do you really need? I think by its nature, an ad network is a middleman. So I think you need us. <laughs> um, in terms of... Um, Services like AdX, HasOffers, Kachava, those types of folks, that, that does seem to add value that an ad network can't really add on their own as kind of a biased player. Um, how many layers? I don't know. Yeah, I think it really comes down to do you have a unique uh, data set that you're contributing to the, the targeting experience, as an example? Um, uh, or do you have unique reach that um, the other middlemen don't? Uh, but you know, it's all about value proposition. 
So from we've, what, what we've heard from our clients is that they're, um, they, they do prefer to go direct with, uh, with their advertisers that they're working with because um, they know that if, if someone has a publisher base of their own, exactly where those users are coming from. Uh, and it also ensures that they won't be bidding against themselves on certain networks because if, if someone were to go to an ad network, there is the chance that, you know, as, as campaigns get rebrokered, that you end up actually starting a bidding war against yourself. As you, as you move through your campaign. So if you know that you're working direct with someone that has their own publisher base, you know exactly what price you're going to pay and there's no chance that you will be, that the, the price will be inflated. But I think it's not possible to, to work direct with more than like 20 partners, right? So if, if you look at uh, Applift, for example, we have uh, 600 uh, media partners that we integrate with. Some of them drive 10 installs per day. Um, but if you sum that all up, you, you have an enormous reach. Yeah? And um, I, I think as, as an advertiser, you couldn't reach out to all those 600 partners and coordinate, coordinate on all of them, yeah? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think the middlemen, I think, speaks to a company's size um, and its capabilities. So we're a vendor. Um, we do something very specific in mobile, and we do it very, very well. Um, and the majority of our clients actually work direct with us. Um, middlemen to us will be companies like agencies. Um, and I think it's up to the client for them to decide whether they want a direct relationship, um, whether they want to use and understand the data, whether they want an agency to try and aggregate the data across multiple vendors and try and give them some kind of seamless cross-ecosystem view. Um, some of these things, I think, are more smoke and mirrors than reality. But I think uh, the concept of middlemen, I think to, to Paul's good point is, a middleman makes sense if they add value. If they don't, then yeah, they're a middleman and they're a dinosaur and they'll, they'll be eradicated at some point. I mean, it's pretty, pretty simple to me. So I think the unanimous view is on this panel is, yeah, I think, I think middlemen serve a purpose. They do have value. I like to think of it as, you know, they act like as an extension to your marketing team. You know, you use them as a vendor. Uh, so gotchas, uh, certainly we've heard all kinds of objections from the ad network side. We've heard them all. Oh, I don't want to work with you. Oh, what's the minimum test? Do I really want to X? Uh, any considerations uh, with the dozens, if not hundreds of ad networks now, uh, recommendations would you give to uh, smaller, medium scale, even large scale advertisers coming into the mix? Uh, pretty open topic. Things like check your references. That's a big one for us. Anything else? Um, make sure you can pronounce my CEO's surname. Sorry. <laughs> Kamakshi Shiva Ramakrishnan. Yes, I did practice that in front of the mirror before my first interview. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a strange question. Um, what would I, I mean, advice on anybody coming into to the business, um, don't try and boil the ocean. Uh, I, I, I see so many clients trying to wire up the flux capacitors to the dilithium crystals to achieve blah, 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 blah. And really it's just a question of just keep it simple. Um, know what you're trying to achieve. Know what the goal is. Know how you're going to measure against that. And off you go. And if you go down there and yes, if you work with multiple partners, might they be bidding against each other or other things that we're, we're frightened about? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that is very much a risk. But what I do know is that after a fairly short period of testing, you will be able to see within that mix who is credible and who isn't and who is doing something special and understands your brand or what you're trying to achieve and who's just along for the ride. So yeah, you're, you're going to waste a bit of money at the start, right? It's called test and learn. That implies failure. But I think if you go in it with a clear approach, you'll figure it out real, real quick who you should be working with. Yeah, I think just to, to your point, uh, knowing what you're solving for before you start spending money is a really yeah. good idea. And a lot, of, a lot of folks come into the market, you've got an app, you want to get it out there, start spraying and praying, but if, you don't, if you're not immediately measuring the results you're getting, you, that learning process is just going to take that much longer. I, I would agree. Yeah, and you don't need to spend a lot of money to, to find out if, if, if this is a good partner you're working with. But if you do want to spend a lot of money, my number's 415-672-0677. Okay. I think sort of to the point of credibility is that if, uh, if an ad network comes up to you and wants you to put a very large sum amount of money on front, right up front, 
uh, without delivering any results that you should be wary of that. Um, there are some of our clients that have been burned by other networks, uh, so just be wary of uh, anyone that wants you to put large sums of money up front. Okay, so with one more question, or one more question for the panel before I turn it over to Q&A. Uh, social media, obviously Facebook, we're gonna have a panel on it, I know in a few, in a few sort of uh, hours here. Twitter is sort of moving into the, uh, into the field now with UA, and uh, one of the panelists brought up an interesting uh, concept, which I see more of these days too, sort of the advent of cacao and these social messaging platforms as a channel for distribution. Uh, Paul, Long Henry, did you have any views on this? And I invite the uh, rest of the panelists to also weigh in too. Yeah, I mean, I think most of us probably noticed uh, Facebook's earnings announcement last night uh, to kind of show the power of uh, social. Um, you know, rumor has it that probably about half of their mobile revenue was from app distribution. Uh, social's damn powerful, uh, and the data is um, hard to beat. Uh, we partnered with Kakao. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, Kakao is like um, uh, like WeChat or WhatsApp or Tango or Line, many of these like social platforms on top of the mobile platforms. They have uh, about 95% penetration in Korea, so they're kind of the mobile version of Facebook in Korea. We partnered with them to power advertising on Kakao-enabled applications. Basically, their model was you know, provide this communications app for you know, large swaths of uh, the population based on your address book on your phone. Then they package that in a, so basically a social SDK so that other Korean applications could have a turnkey social graph in their app, a bit like what a Facebook login would do, um, uh, like through Facebook Connect. Uh, and then they kind of leverage that for um, app cross promotion, uh, such that when you, know, you download an application, very easy for you to recommend it to your friends. And basically, we're bringing our value exchange model to all those uh, connected applications. It's really interesting to see how quickly um, these apps can kind of gain a foothold and how powerful the cross promotion um, and app discovery can be uh, that's driven off of those platforms. I think we'll continue to see that. Uh, Facebook, or I mean, Apple and, and Google seem to be comfortable with it. So um, it's definitely something to pay attention to. And I think, again, looking at Facebook's results, you, you, a lot of folks have been paying attention to it. We, we also make the experience that uh, messaging apps are great distribution partners. Uh, we work with some of them, promote our games on them, and you see they are driving enormous amounts of installs because um, the activity rate on those messaging apps is obviously super high, and um, the, the, the advertisement is pretty low, so it's a perfect environment um, to, to advertise your game. Yeah. Um, I think Facebook and Twitter getting into the market is, is excellent news. Um, I was trying to sell text messaging to brands in the US in 2002. I won't bore you with that story. But the moment that American Idol launched, my job got a ton easier because they'd heard of that text messaging thing. And I think the impact of a brand of that size and that quality entering in the market, yes, it will create competitive pressure, but that's healthy. But I think it will get a lot of brands waking up and starting to spend some really big money and as brands start to spend big money, they start asking, is it working? What else should I be doing? How can I learn more? Help me do X, Y, and Z. And I think that, that uh, the entrance of Facebook, of Twitter, I think is going to be an enormous boon uh, for the market. So yeah, looking forward to it. I definitely think social is, uh, I mean, you just look at, have, to have to look at the success that Candy Crush has had um, with the use of their social mechanics as a, as a great case study for them. Um, and I think that, you know, as, as Paul said, with, with Facebook's earnings statement, it's, uh, it's definitely something that's, that's here and that's, that's around to stay. The, the amount of first party data that they have um, as a means to leverage uh, their channel is, is great. So. All right, so then let's uh, turn it over to Q&A. Uh, Tor and Ike, uh, Fountainhead 9, uh, we are a mobile agency, so hopefully you don't eliminate us. We aren't that middleman. But in terms of retargeting, how do you get around the PII issues? Um, how do you actually develop a profile of someone that's accurate enough that you can actually market to them without violating any of those issues or coming across those issues? Yeah. Um, so we're the first and to my knowledge the only company that is trustee certified with regards to data privacy and, and handling. Um, the core IP of the company that, that um, Kamachi has built is the ability to identify a user across screens 
without using any personally identifiable information. We don't even take Twitter handles, no names, no addresses, no nothing. Um, we try and be very transparent about this. There's video on our site. There's even the white paper that lists the algorithms and, and the formulae that we use. Be happy to go into it. Um, but yes, it is, it is not easy, but it is possible to be able to identify a user across screens and be privacy compliant. Uh, and we've done it to the scale of about 500 million devices linked so far. Yeah, I actually think this is one of the area where agencies actually can be really value add. Um, you know, we have device usage information on like 1.1 billion devices, about 400 million monthly active users, and all the data that we get comes from our SDKs. So it's all basically user data that has been given to us. Um, when you want to target off a of third party data, there's definitely the potential for PII issues where those data, data sets get crossed. However, I think there's like an agency model potentially where there's like a translation of third party data into for what we use is device IDs or um, uh, advertiser IDs in, in uh, iOS context where we don't see the fundamental data, which the third party data, which is driving the targeting. We're just basically targeting based on um, uh, how it's represented to us. And that, that's how we're kind of thinking about it. Uh, shameless plug here. We at rtb.com, we see basically the world uh, shifting to non-PIIA just with the advent of, uh, of things like Apple's ID for, for advertising and, of course, Google's, uh, Google's Android ID. Hi. Uh, my name is Eric Dick. I'm a founder of Tap for Tap, which is an ad network. Um, I want to ask about Candy Crush. This is an absolute phenomenon in the industry, it feels like right now. And I'm wondering your thoughts on whether it signals the sort of the beginning of something amazing, or is it cresting and are we seeing the end of, uh, of this kind of spend? There's rumored to be spending, you know, 100K plus a day uh, on, on user acquisition. I'm wondering, do you think people are, are people going to figure out what they're doing and try to copy it, and will it be too late? Uh, and, and, and maybe what's next? Where do you see things going in terms of the giants like that? Um, I was speaking to another game company that admittedly has a, a fairly strong social play. Um, they were saying when they launch a campaign and they go full throttle, so through organic, through their social plays, through paid acquisition, they can be pushing 100,000 installs a day. So I don't think Candy Crush is, is actually uh, an exception. They're, they're not a rule. But um, yeah, massive scale within the mobile channel is, is definitely possible. I wouldn't expect that it's going away. I think they're getting a great ROI from what I hear about their, the revenue that they're generating. So uh, I think it's penciling out for them. Uh, and, you know, kudos. <laughs> yeah, that's also what, what I hear, uh, that um, the, the monetization in the game is constant and even going up at the moment. Huh? I think they do a really good job of making sure that all the ad networks that they spend on have an ROI basis. As I said before, if you if if you're willing to if the ad networks are willing to work with you and can give you a price that makes sense for your LTV, then you can pretty much run on any network as long as both parties will work together. So I think they've done a really good job with that. Hi, Eric Kanegi, Double Down Interactive. Um, question for you guys: Being on the advertising side of the business, but also have been on the publishing side and the agency side and the ad network side myself. I've seen a bunch of different angles of this space. And a lot of what's happening now on the ad network side in the mobile space reminds me of what happened in display. What are you guys' thoughts about some of those third party verification companies like the double verifies coming into the mobile space so advertisers like me can keep everybody honest and make sure that to your point, you know, a lot of you guys' points that I'm not double dipping or triple dipping or bidding against myself in a lot of these ecosystems? Yeah. Um, they're not enabled right now. They will be. Um, when they have credible solutions, the credible parties will, will adopt them. Um, you know, that's pretty much it. I think these guys are taking a step in the right direction. I still think that at times accuracy is not yet at the level that it needs to be. So I think that doing your own, um, you know, having your own analytics and making sure that you can verify their results as well, especially as you start with new partners, is, is definitely very important. Yeah, there's also some efforts uh, around standardizing um, some aspects of attribution across different networks. Uh, and, you know, depending upon how those things go, and standards are always impossible to predict. Uh, but if, if it works out, potentially that lessens the need for some of those things. 
Uh, our, view, our view too, Erica, is uh, we, we ultimately see that a lot of the, thankfully with tracking providers like uh, has offers, you can see basically ROI at the end of the day, and if it's ROI positive with you, you spend all day. Another area that we see just as important is basically brand control. You know, we've seen a lot of shady creatives out there from other ad networks kind of making it sort of a bad, basically making it more difficult for us as sort of ad networks to, to do business. And I think that there should be a, a way to police brands like that. And meanwhile, I just think it requires a lot of transparency and trust with your ad network. Hi, uh, Adam Miller from Amobi. Uh, I guess the question I do have revolves around something you've touched on, which is re-engagement and even cost per engagement. And I guess just to bring the two together, uh, do you see a future, I guess, for cost per, I guess, transaction models or even cost, cost per purchase models, uh, let's even say post-install? Uh, or do you think that that just requires far too much risk on your end and it becomes a sort of unsustainable model? We definitely run a lot of CPA campaigns that are tied to like mobile commerce transactions, uh, as an example. Uh, as targeting gets better, um, uh, whether it's uh, online retailers or subscription services targeting user base with um, uh, you know, a reward associated with completing a transaction they might, they might complete anyway, I think there's a huge amount of potential there. Um, we're starting to experiment with driving actual retail transactions uh, that are rewarded. So. You're driving a person into a point of sale um, uh, experience and rewarding them once they complete a purchase. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, and, and users respond to it pretty well. As said, uh, we are working with um, media partners, for example, blogs that write a review about um, the game. Um, and those partners, they don't want to have the risk of um, being responsible for driving uh, a purchase in, in the game. Um, so they want to be com compensated on, on the install. Um, but what we are doing is that we are, as I said, um, optimizing the customer lifetime value of the user. So on, uh, over the course of the campaign, we are increasing the CPI for um, traffic sources that are delivering good, uh, good quality and um, converting well on in-game events. So it's basically resulting in the, in the, in the same thing, that um, a traffic source that is delivering good quality um, gets paid a higher CPI. Yeah, Adam. Hey, man. There, there's two answers to that. Um, the short one is, yeah, we do that right now. But the conversion path has to be very clean and very quick. Um, so if it's, you're asking people to jump through hoops, that's just not going to work for, for the brand or, or for the publisher. Um, the other stuff that we do is we do produce the return on ad spend models for our clients and bake that into the reports. And then we, are, uh, then we also then produce what is the forecast on the payback window. So when that they would return all of their ad spend would be achieved, what is that payback window? And then starting to measure subsequent cohorts against that graph. Once you've built that graph or that curve, you can now start to measure subsequent cohorts to see, okay, are we ahead of the graph or not? Are we going to get a sooner return on ad spend? Is the payback going to come back in X months sooner? Um, but yeah, it just comes back to doing the original um, model, whether it's pure... Uh, CPA or, or cost per good scold or cost per booking as we do in the travel category or whether a client's doing a return on ad spend with, with payback window. It's pretty much the same thing. I definitely think that CPE is just going to continue to grow. If you look at what advertisers want right now, they want deeper engagement so CPE can get people further down the funnel. Um, and I think that when you're talking about post-install transactions, it really just depends. It's something that you have to work with uh, on the ad network side with your advertiser to ensure that everything backs out for both parties. So it's something that, you know, you might start with, you know, a transaction where you want someone to buy like a $10 purchase. You find out that maybe that doesn't work. You bring that number down. You just kind of work together to make sure that you can uh, make it a mutually beneficial partnership. At uh, <clears throat> rtb.com, we actually prefer even though we're selling cost per install, we actually ask people to do a post back for the engagement, the downstream conversion. Even though they're buying the install, we want them to be aware of us and that downstream purchase. Uh, and of course, you could do so on, you can create that additional post back on house offers, AdEx, Coachava, what have you. We've got one right here. Hi, I'm Chris from the supply side platform app sponsor. And looking a year out, what do you see trending uh, the highest in-app purchases, Facebook advertising, engagement advertising, brand advertising. If I knew the answer, I'd be a VC and I'd have a Caribbean island. 
uh, all, all of the above. Um, we'll probably know the answer to that question in about 11 months. Um, they're all going to be in the mix. Sorry. Yeah, I think there's a ton of room for brand advertising. You know, you, I think we've all seen Mary Meeker's slides way too often, uh, but the gap between time spent and ad revenue is it's, it's not really closing all that fast. I think it's a function of not having had um, kind of compelling brand experiences uh, available at scale in mobile. And I think a lot of things that we've talked about today around you know, full screen interstitials uh, combined with rich media, et cetera, will allow brands to actually deliver the message that they, um, that they want to deliver uh, in scale. Uh, and I, so I think there's a ton of room for that to accelerate. But I think everything's going to grow. I mean, the market is kind of growing in all directions. Hi right, guys, uh, this is George from Google. I was just curious if your advertisers are getting to the point of sophistication where they're actually deep linking into their app, so not trying to drive an install, but um, kind of doing what they do online where they actually link to a specific product page, but doing that within the app. Like here are my app users, I'm trying to drive sales, not installs. Uh, I was kind of wondering if you're seeing that behavior. Yes. No. <laughs> because on, on, on the game side, it doesn't make uh, much sense. Yeah? You, you start playing a game at the beginning, so it doesn't make uh, sense to link you to level 25 <laughs> when you're starting in level 1. I'd say for, for brand apps, definitely. Uh, we're definitely seeing folks that acquire a user base uh, through our network, and then they retarget those users uh, with a, a call to action to come back and check out a, a sale or a new app application experience or a new feature. Um, so yeah, we're definitely starting to see that using basically protocol handlers to deep link into specific uh, corners of the app. Yeah, I think with brands, you'll see that, but with games, as Hanno said, it doesn't really make much sense, but the brands have sort of more room to, to play on, on that end just because of the way that their apps are created. Hi, uh, James Dilley from uh, DATG, Disney ABC uh, Digital Marketing. And so our model is a little bit different than uh, some here where we're, we're driving toward an app and we have a revenue model that's ad-based. So as we get users into the app, we see that install. Are any of you integrating with like third-party ad servers to either count ads or have calls to, to model around the, the ads actually being served to the users so we can actually get a, a good picture of uh, the true ROI? Or do you know anybody in the marketplace that's doing that, to integrate that third-party? No, not with a third party, but um, I had a conversation with a major publisher the other day, um, and we were talking about a quality audience that they wanted to acquire. Um, let's just say it's with financial content, so it's a, a high CPM um, in terms of the advertising side. And they basically, we just started to run the numbers, and we said, look, you could be looking at anything from a three to five dollar cost per install. To, to get hold of that quality audience that you want. I was then shocked to find out that in terms of the monetization within the app, and this is probably more their issue than, than the market, but they were looking at earning an average of $2 average revenue per user per year. So they were looking at potentially a two-year payback window on that ad spend based on thousands of impressions sold at, at, sold at X CPM. I was, I was very shocked at how low they were monetizing it. Like I said, I, I think it was them. But yeah, I mean, you can definitely, you can definitely model that out. I, I'm not sure one needs a third party ad server to be able to do that. The pricing yield management team would be able to understand app management per user, per, per impression sold, uh, and could probably come up with a, with a revenue per impression number that we could use. Uh, at rtv.com, we do all the ad serving ourselves because basically we're given an opportunity to bid, and if we win on an impression, we serve it up. We have a dashboard. We have an API. We should talk. <laughs> nice. Anybody else? Anybody else want to grill these guys one more? All right. I'm glad I'm not the only one pitching from this guy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Victoria, and I'm from Shutterfly. So we're just getting to buying the app uh, marketing. So my question is, there's a big assumption around all this positive RR is attribution window or the look back window. And uh, you know, we just learned from has offers is everybody has a different window. It's not consistent, right? And from an advertiser point of view, we don't always have the opportunity to say you have to force a single window and everybody is on the same playground. So I want to hear from you guys is what do you guys think? What is right window to look back? Is it statistically modeled? Is it actually forced into the session? Is it one day? Is it seven days? Is it 30 days? And also, would you, when you look at a particular path to conversion, 
uh, is still last click based, based on has offer models. And then when do you think the uh, industry is going to go to multi click, uh, multi touch point when every advertisers, I mean, every publisher share the point to the conversion? Uh, how far away from there is it realistic to expect such things will come? Two great questions look back window and multi touch attribution. Uh, our look back window is 48 hours, um, uh, and we drive a lot of volume. Uh, and, and in general, we get a, a pretty high conversion rate on application installs and engagements within that 48 hour period. Uh, in terms of where the market goes, yeah, I think it's inevitable that it kind of harmonizes on um, a potentially a multi touch approach over time, but it'll probably be done you know, through some kind of a standards effort. Uh, as the market kind of matures and people see what works uh, and where the problems are, and we'll solve around it. If you want to um, see me afterwards, I can give you both the um, the look back conversion windows uh, degradation over 30 days for games, commerce, and travel, showing what you're getting on on day one, and then how the model degrades over 30 days. Based on that, we typically hold around a 14 day look back window. Um, and secondly, in terms of, I think when you say multi-touch attributions are cross-screen attribution, um, yeah, we've completed that study uh, for the travel category. Uh, we've been able to map impressions, clicks, and conversions in mobile to activity taken, transactions made uh, in the travel category within 48 hours of those activities happening in mobile. Uh, we saw 3x the number, 2.5x or 3x the number of um, transactions on the desktop uh, within 48 hours of serving impressions or clicks or conversions in mobile. And uh, I can send you um, that study as well if you like. So we have a seven day look back window to your first question. Um, and then we use, we use house offers at X and we, we go by their, their last touch. So. And no, you've got, you got to be 30, right? You've got 48, <laughs> 14, 7. Come and, on. And we, we have several. Yeah? So there you go. <laughs> Um, because we, it's we not just a confusing market at all. It's really simple to do mobile. <laughs> we, we, we just integrate with the tracking technology of our advertiser and um, just get the post back. So we depend on, on what, uh, whatever the advertiser sets as a post back, uh, as a look back window. Uh, we, we love has offers default 30 w window look back, but uh, of course ours varies between one and 30 days. Really kind of a, defu a function of the advertiser. You know, how much they spend, if they're really focused on performance, how many networks they use, if they use 50, it's going to make a much more, much different, much bigger difference than if they use, say, three, right? So based on this disagreement, I would bet against standards happening anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think it's important for the advertiser to set up expectations and hopefully set look back periods that look good for them and their users over time. Um, yeah, you guys have anything else to add before we release for another half hour? Yeah, it sounds great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you guys for doing this. Thanks for the questions. Thank you.